now it's time for us to get into the conversation of breast cancer. Remember, we said it earlier on the show that October is the Breast Cancer Awareness Month and we are doing our own beats to make sure that you know a lot about what is happening when it has to do with this particular conversation. But we're not having it alone. We already have our special guest in the studio with us and I'll be doing the honors of reading her profile to us this morning. She is Dr. Chine Iwuji and Dr. Chine Iwuji is a consultant medical oncologist colleges working at the University Hospital of Hospitals of Leicester NHS Trust. She qualified from Southampton Medical School and holds a degree in physiology from University of Dundee. Her postgraduate qualifications include a master's degree in oncology, that is the University of Nottingham, and a PhD, University of Leicester, following a research investigating the use of curcuming in the treatment of colorectal cancer. She is our oncologist this morning, and I have a lot of questions for her. In fact, I've started I started drilling. <laughs> I started with the drilling before the cameras came on, but I'm so happy that you're here this morning. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, mm -hmm. I, I, I started with this question before, but I want to start again. Like, mm -hmm. um, how long have you been doing this for? So I have been a, an oncology consultant for the past five years, um, but actually I started my specialty training way before that, about 10 years before that as well. So I have been training in cancer care for a very long time. I mean, I mean, I said it earlier that 10 years, you say it like it's a walk in the park, <laughs> but I mean, that's a lot doing mm -hmm. this. And, you know, I never get to ask professionals how they feel when they meet with patients and have conversations with them. How mm -hmm. is this journey for you? Um, so... I love my job. I, I know a lot of people think cancer, it's depressing, lots of people dying, but actually I think it's a privilege to be able to be with my patients on this journey. And it is not always depressing. There's a lot of hope, you know, there's a lot of wonderful relationships that I forge with my patients. Um, and so I've always loved that and I love learning. There's always more to learn about cancer care. Um, there's always new research, new treatments. So I've always loved all of that. Yeah. Okay, so let's break it down. Mm -hmm. What is breast cancer? Okay, so going back to the basics. Basically, cancer in itself um, is when cells in your body start dividing too quickly. So they sort of go out of control and get bigger and bigger and bigger and then start spreading to other organs where they ought not to be and causing damage. So with breast cancer in particular, it's basically when the cells in your breast start going through that process. Mm. They start dividing uncontrollably and then they can spread to other parts of the body and start causing damage there. Yeah, so as a, as a person, mm -hmm. um, how do you know that you have breast cancer? Okay, so that's a good question. Um, really, breast cancer tends to be difficult to tell or to detect just by symptoms unless you go looking for them, mm. which is why we talk about breast cancer awareness. So the things that um, ladies need to be looking out for, for example, is they need to look out for things like lumps in their breasts, changes in the size of their breast, if they start getting things like their skin gets changes in consistency, maybe it starts looking like the skin of an orange, mm -hmm. or it gets red, um, sore, inflamed, or if their nipples, if they notice that their nipple changes position, or they start getting a discharge from their nipple. Those are the sort of things that make you suspicious that you might have a breast cancer. But you can imagine if we're talking about knowing about the size of, and shape of your breasts, then you have to be used to what is normal for you. So you need to start examining your breasts now when they're normal so that if anything abnormal happens later, you can then detect it more easily. You know, I, I was reading through um, uh, an article on breast cancer and then I saw there that breast cancer doesn't just happen to females, that it just happens to males. How come? Well, Actually, yes, breast cancer does happen to males. It's more rare in males, so about one in every hundred cases of breast cancer, so 1% of breast cancers um, occur in males. But when you think about it, men have breast tissue as well. It's just a lot smaller. Um, so because they have breast tissue like women do, they can be prone to getting, they can get breast cancer. It tends to happen more for men who are, let's say, uh, extremely overweight, more obese, because then they will have more breast tissue or if they have what we call liver cirrhosis, so sort of damage to the liver that can mm. affect their breast tissue. Um, it tends to happen more in men in those situations or if they have a family dis predisposition to breast cancers. So, um, I, I, you know, I was asking you something on um, risk factors yes. and fear factors mm. and all of these things. So mm. what are the risk factors? 
Okay, so um, there's sort of different categories of risk factors. So there's some that we have control over and some that are out of our control. So if we talk about the ones that are out of our control, that's things like, you know, if you have a lot of people in your family, so a lot of your relatives, your mother, your sister, your brother even, um, if they have had breast cancer, particularly at a young age, so under the age of 50, then that increases your risk of having breast cancer. It doesn't mean you'll definitely get it, so it's not to scare people, um, but it just means that your risk is a bit higher and you need to be more vigilant. Things like the age you um, started your menstruation uh, versus the age you have menopause, that can mm. put you at risk of breast cancer if, if there's a long gap in that time. Um, and as we get older, um, we're more at risk of breast cancer. So if we are, for ladies over the age of 50, then that's when the risk of breast cancer increases. But in terms of things we can control, so people will always talk about diet. Um, and it's always good to have a healthy diet. There are no particular foods that are related to breast cancer, but we know that if you have a healthy lifestyle, that reduces your risk of having breast cancer. If you are overweight, that increases your risk of having breast cancer. So you want to be healthy um, and keep your weight down. Exercise has been shown to reduce the risk of breast cancer as well. Um, alcohol significantly increases the risk of breast cancer. Everyone knows about the, the, the connection between smoking and developing cancer in general. Mm -hmm. um, so it's those kind of factors. So there are things in our lifestyles that we can control that can reduce the risk of us getting breast cancer. All right, so we asked a question and um, we got some comments that I'd like to read out okay. to you and then we can address this um, mm -hmm. conversation. So mm -hmm. uh, we asked our, our viewers, how regularly do you check for long in your breast. Now, in fact, before I even go into the comments, how regularly should you check for lumps in your breast? And of course, I'll later ask you, how can you check for it? But mm -hmm. how regularly should you check for lumps in your breast? Okay, so that's a good question. Look, it's not something that we need to get obsessive about checking every single day to freak ourselves out. Okay. Um, I would say once a month is adequate. And also just be aware that around um, the menstrual cycle, so when you're having your periods, you might find that your breasts become more lumpy um, or just more dense. So it's mm -hmm. useful to know what your breasts feel like and what is normal for you around your menstrual cycle versus when you're off at uh, that time of the month. So I would say once a month is, is adequate. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Because I've heard people say, oh, you have to check it. You have to go about doing it. Mm -hmm. Don't be scared, but just go check it and all of that. All right, so mm -hmm. let's get into the comments. So we have Tayo from Lagos. And Tayo says, I always check it, pressing and trying to fill it. I hate being caught of guard. So mm -hmm. is that how to go about it, like pressing and filling and mm -hmm. all of those things? So actually, yes, it's, I mean, you don't have to make it, it's, it doesn't have to be a painful experience and you press until you feel pain, but you do need to be quite firm because some of these nodules can be very small. Um, so, you know, just w when you're, for example, getting dressed in the morning or when you're having your shower, that's quite a good time to just say, okay, I'll just check it now. And like I say, once a month is, is adequate, but just feel quite deeply, particularly around the nipple area, the whole breast area, you should go quite high up into the upper chest okay. and also in your armpits actually because sometimes the breast cancer can spread to what we call the lymph nodes and those nodes, they're sort of little tiny bean shaped uh, nodules in the body that deal with the immune system mm. and if the breast cancer is going to spread, that's one of the first places it can spread. So check your armpits as well as the breast. Okay. All right, so let's get into this next comment. This is from Ayomide from Mogan State. And Ayomide says, I check occasionally, but not every time. Not with getting to work very early and coming back late, but I think I should start checking now. My friend and I once had a conversation about breast cancer when she lost her aunt to it. Since then, she has been so scared of getting it. She believes it's genetic. Is it, though? So, um, actually... It can be genetic, mm. but not all breast cancers are genetic. Okay, so we have a proportion of breast cancers that are related to what we call the BRCA gene. Mm. Um, so the BRCA gene is more common if you have a high family history of breast cancer. So if you have a number of relatives, like I said, if you have about two or three or four immediate family members, so that's like your mother, your sister, your daughter, um, who, who have breast cancer, then there's a higher risk that you might have a familial genetic uh, 
predisposition to breast cancer, mm -hmm. but it's not 100% sure. So you actually need to do the test. Just because you have those, that history in your family doesn't necessarily mean you have the genetic predisposition. There's a test that you can do to check that. And if you're found to have that predisposition, then you should go for your screening more regularly. You should go for mammograms. Um, instead of going for mammograms, say, after the age of uh, 45 to 50 every three years, if you're known to have a genetic predisposition, you should probably start earlier, in your 30s even, and have the screening every year. So, I mean, you, your old ages, as you've been mentioning, mm. are older ages. I mean, mm. earlier you've mentioned 50s, mm. um, you've mentioned 30s and all that, but mm. I've had stories of people younger yes. having it. Mm -hmm. Why? So like I say, for if you do have this genetic predisposition, you might get breast cancer at a younger age. So that's why they start screening as young as 20 um, in some cases, if wow. you have the particular gene. Um, but what I would say is that it's more common in ladies over 50. I think in the African, in the Nigerian setting, we might find that we have a younger population. So I would say, actually start your screening at the age of 40 here in Nigeria, just because we don't have the data to really support when, to, when is appropriate for us in our population. So I would say from the age of 40, yes, definitely we should be doing these examinations. Um, but if you're a young girl, less than 40, and you feel something in your breast that's unusual, still go and get checked out because it might not be cancer. There are other things that can cause lumps in your breast, but better to be safe than sorry. Yeah, okay. All right, this next comment is from Eunice from Lagos. And Eunice says, hmm, breast cancer, lol, I'm a guy. I almost never check. <laughs> well, you already said it. That. Mm -hmm. So how do guys check? Is it the same process? It is the same process. I mean, what I would recommend is that you just start by, start at the nipples, whether you're a guy or a girl, and just work your way out in a circular motion until you get right to the top, and then, like I said, under the armpit. So guys should do the same as women. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Well, you've heard it, Eunice. Please go check yourself out. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, Miriam from Ogun State is saying, not necessarily, especially at a young age, there are a lot of different kinds of benign breast tumors mm -hmm. um, like fibrodenoma, mm -hmm. phyllodes tumor, but it is always better to do uh, FNAC tests to check the nature of the lump. What is an FNAC test? So I think what she's basically saying is that it's true, there are different things that can cause breast lumps. So sometimes it might just be an infection. It might be what we call a cyst, which is basically almost like a boil, a fluid-filled sac in the breast. Um, so do your breast examination, and then if you feel anything unusual, you should go and get it imaged, so have a mammogram. If you're under the age of 40, it might be useful to get an MRI because younger ladies have denser breasts, so you might not pick it up on the mammogram. And then if it's still suspicious, you should get a biopsy. So you should mm. actually get a sample of the breast tissue taken out so that we can look at it under the microscope and check whether or not this is breast cancer. Okay, um, let me take um, another one. This is from Damala from Lagos. And Damala is saying, as a mother, I check every morning while bathing. I think that's okay. Yes. That's, that's fine. If she does it while she's having up her bath, that is fine. Not necessarily every morning, but whenever you're having a bath, it's reasonable. To so check. is it all lumps that are cancerous? No, absolutely right. not. So the vast majority of lumps will not be, be cancerous. Like I said, it might just be an infection. Um, some women just have lumpy breasts, actually, you know, so that's why it's useful to know what is normal for you. Um, and some of them will be, like I say, these cysts or boils. So it might even be a fat-filled lump. There are all sorts of different uh -huh. causes for lumps in women. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a breast cancer. Just get it checked out and get yourself reassured. So it is, it is um, nothing that you should be scared about? No, because I think a lot of us, you know, because of the fear factor associated with cancer, which is understandable, a lot of people will say, oh my goodness, I don't want to find out. And then they will just bury their heads in the sand. And if it isn't a cancer, you're just scaring yourself for a long period of time when actually you could have gotten reassurance. And if it is a cancer, then the sooner we get the treatment, the better. You know, breast cancer can be cured. And even if it's spread to the areas where we can't cure it, a lot of women live with breast cancer. You don't have to die from breast cancer. So actually, you're doing yourself more harm than good by running away from what, what the situation might be. Yes, let's talk about your experience with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, addressing your patients and mm -hmm. having conversations with them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, somebody walks into your clinic and they want to, you know, get examined and all of that. And then you realize that you, uh, this person has 
breast cancer. Walk us through how you go with that process. Because mm -hmm. in my mind, I would think that, oh, this person, ah, <laughs> you, something's going to happen and all mm -hmm. of But how do you go, go about it? So I think for me, the most important thing to remember is there is always hope. Okay, mm -hmm. there's always hope. And yes, it is a terrifying experience. No matter how many times I break the news to a lady or any patient, I always remember how scary it is for them. And I don't know what it's like for them on the other side of that consultation. But it's important for me to let them know that there is something we can do. You know, we might be able to cure this. Even if we can't cure it, we might be able to control this. Even if we can't control the cancer itself, we can control the symptoms. There is always something we can do. And it's important for me not to just you know, go in as a doctor and say, this is what I'm going to do. It's a conversation. What are your concerns? What are your fears? What are your worries? And how can I address those worries as well? So it's a two-way thing. So that Also so that the person I'm talking to, the patient, the lady, feels empowered. Because when you get a cancer, you feel, oh my goodness, I'm going to die. It's all out of my control. It's terrible. But it's about giving them back some control and saying, mm -hmm. okay, this is what you're worried about. What are your targets? Like we were discussing earlier, it might be the lady will say, oh my goodness, my daughter is getting married next year. Will I see her wedding? And I'll say, okay, fine. That's a that's great we have a target now let's get you to that wedding you know and that's how I try and deal with the situation just little targets at a time so mm -hmm. uh, if you're able to get them through in that process do they come back to you know um, tell you um, how they feel their experiences generally or do they just run away so it's a mix. I mean, to be fair, I have only um, been in Nigeria for four weeks now. I've just started working at Lakeshore Cancer Center. So in, in the UK, um, I have found that we go through the process together. But in Nigeria, it's a bit different because you have financial constraints. Mm -hmm. You have um, people's fears. So you might find that some patients do run away and you, you sort of break the news to them and then you don't see them again. And that is their choice. It might not be a choice that I agree with, um, and, but I have to respect that. But for the patients who have a good experience or who are, I'm able to build a rapport with and trust with, they do come back. Mm -hmm. And it's important that we go through, I don't just prescribe chemotherapy and then disappear. I go through that journey with them, with every cycle of treatment. I'll be seeing them to check up on what side effects they're having, if they're having any side effects, how can we adjust their medication to make sure that it suits them, mm -hmm. not just that they're suffering on their own and have been given this horrible treatment that they have to endure. It doesn't need to be that way. Mm. It should be, we should be able to maintain your quality of life as you go through this journey. Mm. I mean, you know, we, we've talked about some um, different types. So do, do we have more types of breast cancer? Yes. So well, what are those? There are different kinds of breast cancer. So it depends on number one, the location of the breast cancer. So you talk about whether it's isolated to a particular part of the breast. Okay. Number two, we talk about um, the actual pro um, the sort of the hormones that are driving the cancer or the proteins that are driving the cancer and that's how we t target the specific treatment that we give to the lady we talk about the staging of the cancer as well so how far has it spread where where is the cancer in the body and that also affects this, the treatment that we're able to give the lady so it's there's types in terms of location the things that's driving the cancer and the extent of the cancer as well so so um if now we've come to realize that you can get examined early mm -hmm. and then you you find out that you may have breast cancer so what are the treatments what do i do so yeah. now that i know what mm -hmm. can i do okay so basically if you have been told that you have a diagnosis of breast cancer you need to see an oncologist you need to see a cancer specialist because there are different kinds of treatments so you can have surgery so it might be um you know surgery to remove the the breast mass itself you might have um, radiotherapy, you might have chemotherapy, or you might have hormone therapy. Hmm. So those different treatments depend on, like I say, the size of the tumor, where it has spread. And um, a lot of ladies, for example, will have the surgery and think, oh, it's gone now, so I don't oh. need anything else. But actually, when we take out those lumps, we have a look at them and we say, how aggressive is this cancer? What are the chances it might come back? And based on that, we will then decide whether you still need radiotherapy, chemotherapy, hormone therapy as well. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you mentioned something that's interesting. Mm -hmm. When you do treatment, mm -hmm. it doesn't just go, because I hear people say there is a second attack, something mm -hmm. happened, mm -hmm. and all of these things. Why does that come? Happen. Okay, so that's a good question. So sometimes when we do the surgery, we can only see what the visible eye can see. But mm -hmm. there might be tiny microscopic cells, so small that we can't see them with the naked eye, that are still in your system. 
So we need to go back and have a look and see what are the chances that those cells are there. And mm -hmm. if they're in the system, that's when we do things like radiotherapy to try and mop up any cells that are still left behind. And chemotherapy goes throughout the whole body and kills off any of those tiny cells that we might not be able to see to make sure that they don't then start growing years down the line and cause the cancer to come back. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm. Um, you know, this is, this is it's a, a lot. lot. It's a lot. It's a, it's lot, a lot to take in. And, yeah. you know, you said something about fear factor. How mm. do you help, you know, these patients manage it? Because mm. I am taking in all of this information and mm. I am trying to put myself in somebody else's shoes. I'm mm. like, wow, mm. how do you take in some of these things? And, you know, mm -hmm. here is one thing that I want to ask you. Mm. Do you advise people not to Google some of the symptoms because they uh, get scared? That's also a good question. So... Google can be your friend, okay, but it can just mess you up if you look in the wrong sites as well. Mm. So what I tend to do is direct people towards responsible uh, websites, okay. you know, so um, I, Cancer Research UK, for example, gives really, really good basic information about cancer. So it speaks in simple English and explains all the sort of all the symptoms, all the signs, the treatments, even what to look out for. So that would be a helpful website. What I don't think is advisable is just going randomly on Google and then you start looking at someone's blog and they start giving you sort of alternative treatments that they did that there's no evidence for or tell you about horrific experiences that, again, that's what happened to them. It doesn't mean it's what's going to happen to you. you and you end up frightening yourself. So you have to sort of look these things up responsibly. And I would say get advice from the medical team as to where to look. We give a lot of information leaflets, and those are, that can that point you in the right direction. Hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. now let's talk religion, Yes. the religious factor. Yes. So I was telling you about a story that we read earlier on the show where mm -hmm. there's a lady that uh, she was bleeding mm. from her nipples and, you know, it was painful, mm -hmm. but then she just patted her breast, she went to work, and then she just told somebody randomly that, okay, so this is happening to me, and then they asked her to get to the hospital to find out. So the first check, mm -hmm. uh, they diagnosed her for, you know, breast cancer, but then she didn't believe it because, no, I'm too young. She, mm -hmm. I mean, at age 23. Yeah. She's 23, I'm too young to have this kind of thing, so no, it can't be me. My mom died at age 53 or 54 mm -hmm. of kind of breast cancer, so I have to be that old before mm -hmm. I get to that point. And then she went to get a second opinion, and it was the same thing. So um, they told her to come and start radiotherapy, but then at some point, I think she had to leave and then, you know, consult religious leaders and do all of those things. But then her spirit told her to go back and do radiotherapy that I've given you all the resources that you need to get healed. So exactly. go and get your healing and all mm -hmm. of that. So mm -hmm. that is for somebody that went back to the clinic and maybe because they had wise counsel and all of that so mm -hmm. the religious factor is you know people that go and never come back and then mm -hmm. they believe whatever it is that your religious leader has said that oh don't go to the hospital mm -hmm. don't do this and all that how do you address such issues okay so i'm a person of faith myself and i think your faith is an important it, it is a fundamental part of your journey your faith is there to support you through this difficult time um, but it's not something that we're supposed to use as an excuse not to do the right thing. Hmm. I think seeking our religious leaders, we both have responsibilities. The religious leaders have the responsibility to point their, their congregation in the right direction. And we as doctors have a responsibility as well to say, your faith is important to you. Hold on to that faith. It's not for, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Actually, the two should work together synergistically. So they should work together to help the person through that journey. Um, so I would never say to my patient, don't go to your religious leader. And therefore, I don't see why the religious leader should say, don't go to the doctors. We are given tools. You know, God works in all sorts of ways. Sometimes he will heal you through medicine. And sometimes he will heal you miraculously, but you need to do your part. You know, you need to actually take the steps in the right direction. If you have the opportunity to get medical help, then get it. That might be the avenue God is leading you through in order to get your restoration. So mm. it's not up to us to dictate to God how he's going to do it. We do the right thing and then he works how he chooses to work. Yeah, I, I like, I like, like you said that. And I like that, you know, you, you said that religious leaders should, you know, play their part mm -hmm. and tell people to go and get medical checkups as often as possible. Because we've mm -hmm. heard different stories. We've taken stories that, mm -hmm. you know, people died because they didn't do the needful and unfortunately they didn't have people to push them mm. to 
go get their um, checkup. So I want you to talk about the importance of early detection. Yes, yeah. Early detection is crucial. I mean, it really does have an effect on outcomes. So, for example, where you have uh, routine breast cancer screening in the UK, having early detection reduces the deaths per year by 1,300 cases. So that's 1,300 women that are alive despite being diagnosed with breast cancer, but it is because they caught the breast cancer at an early stage. And then let alone in somewhere like Nigeria, we're talking about financial implications. The earlier you catch the breast cancer, not only are we more likely to cure it, but it's, it can be less expensive because the treatment is less complex when mm. it's a smaller mass as opposed to if it's a bigger mass or it's spread to different parts of the body. So early detection is key. That's why breast cancer awareness is key. Let's talk about the role of the media mm. in this particular conversation. Mm. I know that people are trying, um, the media parasitals that we have are trying as much as possible to you know, do the awareness, mm -hmm. but I see a lot of things out. Before now, before I started reading up on um, cancer, all the information that I had on cancer were in movies. Mm. And I mean, for me to recognize somebody that has cancer, if their hair is falling off, mm. they're tearing scarves and mm. all of those things. Do you think there's some kind of misrepresentation mm -hmm. in the media out there? And do you think that the media is helping out or, or they're doing otherwise? I think... You Yes, the media is a double-edged sword, isn't it? So on the one hand, media is great at raising awareness. Um, I think as we're talking about early detection, if, you, if we get rid of the taboo of the word cancer, then the media can help us with that by saying to people, get screened, you know, like what we're doing this morning. But things like movies where, like you say, women are losing their hair, they're ill, they look like they're dying, I won't lie, chemotherapy or the treatment can be difficult, but it doesn't have to be. And a lot of the things that are portrayed, like you know, vomiting all the time and all the rest of it, we have a lot of medication that can help prevent that now. Hmm. You know, we've moved on significantly. Every day we continue to move on in how we control the cancer, how we control the side effects of the treatment that we give. So it doesn't have to be this horrible negative journey that is portrayed. Cancer does not always equal death, which is the other thing that can be portrayed. People can survive cancer or they can live with cancer for years. So the media has to get that balance right in raising awareness and reducing the fear factor. So before I let you go, I'd like that you, you know, talk to people out there and encourage them to actually go and get examined. Yes. Um, let's talk about how important it is for them mm -hmm. to see an oncologist if they're going through something. Because I've seen stories of women that know, but they just say, well, if I'm going to die, let me just die. Anyways, mm -hmm. and I don't need to waste money or do any of these things because it's going to end up this way for me. So mm -hmm. I'd like that you encourage them and then you talk to them. Absolutely. Um, thank you for giving me this chance. Look, I would say to all the ladies out there and to some of the men as well, just don't be afraid. It doesn't, you don't have to be afraid of this whole journey. Do the responsible thing. Do your breast examinations. If you're worried, seek help, like I said, from a cancer center, an oncologist, a medical doctor. Just get the test done and then we can go on that journey together, worst case scenario or it might turn out to be nothing and then you get the reassurance. But there are cures for cancer um, and we can control the symptoms. It doesn't have to be a death sentence. So I would just say just do the right thing and then your outcome can still be bright. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Cheney, for joining me this morning. Mm -hmm. It's been an enlightening one. <laughs> and you made it relaxing, you know, because <laughs> there's been, um, you've, you've helped me, you know, break down all the myths and the mm -hmm. taboos and mm -hmm. the fear factor mm -hmm. and all of that. Because I, I know a lot of young people are out there like, ah, if I check it now, hmm, I don't know what's going to happen. But yes, one more thing. Yes. How do you check for lumps? So what mm -hmm. do we do? How do I, I mean, I know you were saying something about touching the yes. armpits and all mm -hmm, that. So mm -hmm. how do I, what do I do? It's, it's really very basic. You, you literally just, so you've got the arm like this. You have to put your hand inside there, push quite deep until you get, you can feel the bottom, can't you? Yes. Yes, so you can feel the bottom and just go all the way round inside and then all the way round the outside of that armpit and then push right in the middle of the arm as well. Okay. Okay. And then for the breast itself, like I said, you just start on the nipple, push hard in the middle, work your way round, 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 just in circles until you get to about here. So just keep pushing, pushing hard, really push down because if you have a lump, you'll feel it. It'll be like a pea size. If there's anything sinister, what to look out for is, does it feel hard? 
Does it feel firm? It almost feels like you have a stone in your breast. That's mm. what it would feel like if it was, you know, breast cancer related. And it can be of different sizes. And like I said as well, check your nipples. If your nipples look like they've moved or there's any sort of discharge, so any fluid, any fluid coming from that nipple. Um, and the skin of the breast, if it's, instead of it being smooth, if it starts looking like the skin of an orange, you know, with holes in it, yeah. those are the things to look out for. Thank you so much. Okay. I hope you've learned one or two things from the conversation that I've had with Dr. Chinaya Iwuchi this morning. We've talked about breast cancer and we have broken it down to the smallest bits. One of the things that you need to do is actually check and you can do this by yourself. And if you find anything that is strange in your breast, I think that you should have a conversation with a professional that can help you, you know, weather through that particular situation that you're at. We have more to come on Tea or Coffee. I'm going away.